Hello, students. Welcome to Fatigue Analysis. I'm Dr. Stewart. Today, we're going to look at cycle counting algorithms that are used in variable amplitude loading. Cycle counting algorithms are methods that reduce complicated variable amplitude load data into a number of discrete, simple, constant amplitude loading events. We can think about cycle counting out algorithms as taking noisy val data and cleaning it up and sorting it into very uh, 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 organized fashion. Uh, the example we have here is some random variable amplitude loading data. We can see that the stress amplitudes are all over the place and they are inconsistent with time. What we do is in essence sort these different amplitudes and get them arranged in order from the largest to the smallest, creating blocks of cycles at a fixed amplitude that we can very easily apply in an experiment or very easily uh, put into our computations, put in our software to predict cycles to failure, right? This data down below is much easier to deal with when the data within the data up above. How do we process that data? Well, there's a number of algorithms we can use. There are single parameter approaches, which are fairly simple, and then there are the double parameter approaches, which can be a little bit more challenging. Today, we're gonna to learn about all three of the simple parameters and one of the double parameter laws, which is rain flow. Let's start with level, cross, uh, level crossing counting. Uh, this is where we count each time a positive slope passes a po certain portion of the history. And we keep counting uh, up for each for, uh, along the positive slopes as well as along the negative slope portions. And then we combine those counts to produce completed cycles. Let's see an example. Here we have some random uh, variable amplitude data. And what we do is we set levels of strain. And as we cross those levels, we take a count. And once we've processed all of our counts into a table, we can then sort and add those counts up in order to produce full cycles. Now notice when we're counting here, we're creating these full cycles. We're trying to go from the furthest or the largest range. So we'll take these points here and uh, perhaps these points there, to produce this biggest cycle. And then we'll try to produce the next biggest cycle from the next biggest peak. So that would be these points here, and maybe those points there, and some points here, to create the next biggest cycle, and so on, until we uh, have our sorted data. Another approach is peak counting. This is where we record the peaks and valleys in the data. And then we try to combine those peaks and valleys to form completed cycles. So here we've got that same data, but instead we're focusing on where our peaks and our valleys are. So as long as we have a continuous slope and, you know, we, we go, but as soon as we have a reversal of slope, that's where we set a, a count point. Once we've added up all of our peaks, and we've uh, uh, added up all the peaks in the structure, we then can form completed cycles by taking those peaks and, and saying that those peaks represent a cycle. So in this example here, the, the, the lowest value is A, the highest value is D. We take that range and we form a cycle. Then we take the next uh, uh, two uh, highest peaks and we form another cycle. The third simple approach is simple range counting. This is where we focus purely on what are the ranges uh, 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 that we have to create half cycles, and then we take those half cycles and form a complete cycle. It looks very similar to the previous peak counting where we just have these, these peaks, but what we're doing instead is we're just taking the portion we ran under and then trying to form cycles from those portions. 
Beyond the simple single parameter approaches, there are the more complex double parameter approaches. One of them, and one of the most popular, is rain flow counting. This is a, a method developed by Endo in 1968, and it is a method that is fairly popular for uh, uh, dealing with variable amplitude loading data. Let's kind of get right into it. Rain flow counting is analogous to raindrops falling on a pagoda roof and how those raindrops would run down the multi-tiered roof of those buildings. Uh, in essence, what we're going to do is we're going to take our load history information and rotate it and then draw lines. Of course, I mean, this, we can do this graphically, but I mean, we would do this with a computer, but we would draw how the rain would flow down this data. And where if the line is allowed to continue to flow in, into infinite time, then we form a completed hysteresis loop. And where if the, the line is not allowed to continue to flow, but must pass on another shelf, then we form only a partial loop for, for those where we're, we're going to encounter other obstacles. We can describe that in, in more elaborate language here, but let's just kind of graphically see how it works. So we have that, that same diagram, and we see that we have rain that flows from A to B, it flows down the shelf to D, and then it continues until the end of life, all the way for infinite, si for infinite time. This is gonna create a hysteresis loop. But then we also have this example from B to C, where from B to C, we go down and we encounter another shelf. That means we will not form a full loop, but we're gonna form a partial loop. Once we've processed all of our data using this algorithm, we can end up forming uh, completely closed hysteresis loops and partial loops for our body by taking the data and, and plotting the stress strain response for the full data. And, and of course, with these hysteresis loops, we can then go and use uh, uh, Moro's mean stress correction uh, model uh, uh, for, for strain life and then also Miner's damage rule to predict the cycles to failure for this very variable amplitude data. So the rain flow method is very popular because of, because of this capability of, of getting these loops. Uh, and of course, there are other more elaborate methods uh, that, that you can explore to processing variable amplitude data, uh, such as the race, racetrack method and others that are, are in our book. Now, to summarize uh, the, the methods we did see, well, we can say that the simpler methods, such as level crossing, peak, and simple range, these methods, in the way that they're formed, do not take into account sequence effects, meaning a previous cycle where the first cycle does not affect the next. We're taking the data and simply sorting it by the biggest to the smallest and then using whatever equations we want to use from there. So these simple approaches are not going to, are going to be uh, very uh, non-conservative in their predictions, right? We also can summarize that taking these methods, simple methods, as well as the rain flow method, we can take the results and apply the stress life or the strain life approach to the data and then make some predictions. Okay, so that's our second video for variable amplitude loading. In our next video, we'll learn how to make those life estimations using the stress life and the strain life approach. And we'll also look at what, what are some modifications we have to make when dealing with linear elastic fracture mechanics approach. All right, everyone, I'll see you in the next video. Remember to subscribe to the channel. Goodbye.